evening ladies and gentlemen welcome to another episode of the life positive show i hope all of you are thinking positive and taking good care of yourself the topic of tonight's discussion is how to make a marriage work we are taught plenty of things in school but we are never taught how to handle relationships especially marriage which is one of the most crucial and pivotal relationships of our lives we mostly flounder our way through marriage and blame our spouse or in-laws for our unhappiness is there a way to navigate the choppy waters of relationships is there a way to make marriage work make it successful to see uh mental health coach author relationship counselor will be our friend philosopher and guide tonight and share her deep insights on this topic of how to make a marriage work uh, which is one of the most challenging aspects of our lives so uh suzy is a woman of many many talents Uh, she is she is the creator of world's first karma wisdom oracle and author of the international bestseller seven karma codes in english italian and serbian tuzi singh is a mental health coach founder of weed circle international speaker certified clinical hypnotherapist karma coach and a youtube educator she is a board of advisors members to the mental health ngo we listen and a business world 40 under 40 health care and well being awards jury member Suzy has helped thousands of people worldwide through personal therapy sessions has authored innumerable articles in leading publications and speaks extensively on trauma grief karma and consciousness at various international platforms welcome suzy it's a pleasure to have you tonight with us thank you very much shivi and i'm so glad to be back into the life positive family with today's show because i've had a very long and loving association with this family that's so true and i i am a part of your journey with life positive uh, and i've seen you uh, contribute so beautifully to the magazine and raise uh, the the quality of his uh, of the contents so i'm truly grateful to you suzy so let us begin with the first question tonight which is a uh, So I want to know we enter marriage with plenty of hopes only to realize that marriage is not a bed of roses so why do you think uh, or where do you think we go wrong so shivi i'm just wondering you know we all had a lot of opportunity to do these work from home calls during the pandemic and uh, i'm wondering if you've ever had this experience where you speak to someone for the first time on a zoom call and you create a certain impression about that person thinking he oh i think in real life he'll be really tall and he'll be well built etc you develop some perceptions about that person and then you go and meet him in real life and you exclaim that oh my god i almost expected you to be abc right so that is what before marriage and after marriage really looks like because your perception is colored by your imaginations your fantasies what you believe to be true and reality can be pretty much to fruit the first reason for this is your own expectations because they are based on fact and not verified uh, they're based on fiction and not verified facts so there are many marriage myths that create these perceptions for example the first one is um, when you think of marriage and you think of love and you think of walking into the sunset holding hands together and immediately there is a feeling of there'll be a lot of romance it will be a romantic association and i've had so many couples come to me with this issue women in particular who feel that you know we want that element of romance and it's completely missing there's no spontaneity everything is by the book everything is agenda based ye karna hai wo karna hai where is the romance in the marriage so that expectation of romance starting from 
in my time, I remember it was Annette Blyton's and the tall, dark, handsome Italian man and expecting that your partner is going to be like that. And I'm sure there has been a lot of that expectation of the man who's going to come on the riding on a white horse and sweep me off my feet. That doesn't happen. And then there is this whole idea. The second uh, myth is that my partner will complete me. So you go into marriage with this idea of, okay, uh, in my family of birth, I encountered, you know, many things that created an emptiness or a void inside of me as I was growing. And I'm hoping that when I meet my partner, the right person I want to spend the rest of my life with, then he will take care of me. He will fill the void. He and I together will be a complete whole. That he and I together is going to be a complete whole never ever happens. And that creates one of the key issues of dissonance in the marriage that I thought that we were going to complement each other. I thought you were going to stand in for me and support me. What happened? Then there is another myth that a lot of women, particularly in our country, feel that then I will be free to do as I want. I will finally be able to go out. We'll be able to do the things that we wanted to do. We can go for the movies and we can go to the restaurants. And it's particularly those who've grown up in environments which are orthodox or where there has been a lot of control in the family of birth. And what they don't factor in is that there will be many other constraints that being married are going to bring to you, even if you're in a nuclear setup, even if you're living on your own. So these are the three mythical issues. There's a fourth one, which also creates a lot of trouble and is least spoken about for the uninitiate, those who have not been in relationships before, there is a feeling that the sex will be great. And I will experience bliss because they've seen so many of those movies and the Suhagrat concept and all of it looks very beautiful on screen. But they're probably going to uh, have trouble. It's not going to be such a great experience. It takes time, skill, expertise to be able to learn each other's, um, how to stimulate each other, how to satisfy each other. And this is a subject never spoken about. People are shy. And trust me, this is one of the paramount issues which we unearth in marriages with trouble that we are not satisfied with either the frequency of um, intimacy or we're not happy with um, feeling that's oneness when we are together. Or there is just not enough um, time spent in arousal and you're just bashing around in bed and, you know, getting it done with. And I think somewhere... Paulo Coelho has contributed to this by writing his book 11 Minutes because it's not an 11 minutes thing. I mean, in our own Indian tradition, the wisdom of the Kama Sutra really says you have to win the heart of each other. And today's busy um, time schedules, there is no room for winning each other's heart and feeling that sense of complete oneness in the intimacy. So these are some of the um, fiction versus fact issues. I'll come to the second one, which is, you know, marriage is something which is a given for everybody. We know that the likelihood that we are going to uh, tick off the boxes on education and then settle down with someone is pretty much a given. And yet we have absolutely no training, no tools, no frameworks that are provided to us. We walk into marriage being completely completely illiquid. And so what happens that if you've been part of a nuclear family, let's say, then you only have one framework of reference, that is your parents' marriage. And if your parents' marriage has been troublesome, then you think that, that is the only way marriage is. And let's not forget that young boys grow into men by imitating the behavior of their fathers because that's how they learn to be men. And girls imitate their women, uh, will imitate their mothers and grow up to be women. So what's going to happen is they will imitate the gender roles of their parent. And even though intellectually they may say that 
um, you know, we want our marriage to be very different from our parents' marriage because there was so much dysfunction in my parents' marriage. They end up unconsciously making the same mistakes. So let's say a boy has uh, grown up in an environment where his father has been fairly dominating, um, pushing the mother, the boy's mother around, having his say met. And this boy has grown up thinking that I'm not going to be that kind of husband. And then fast forward into the future and we find that his wife has the same complaint that he uh, doesn't give me space. He doesn't allow me to do the things that I want to do. He's too dominating. He doesn't let me take my own decisions. I'm stifled in the relationship. So we end up perpetuating the dysfunctions of a parent's marriage because that's the only framework we have seen. It's somewhat better in joint families, perhaps, because in joint families, you know, it's not just your parents' wedding, uh, the marriage, but you're also able to reference it to maybe cha-cha, taya, un sab ki shadiyan kaisi hain. Maybe if somebody's marriage is better off, then you're able to sort of compare notes. But you'll always see your parents' marriage most closely. And nothing, you, you are not sent to a premarital training school at all. Which leads me to the third issue, which is there's far too much focus in Indian weddings or most weddings across the world on all the external factors. You know, it's the big fat Indian wedding. All the expenses are on clothes and jewelry, on entertainment, on food, on um, what has to be lena dena, what has to be given in the marriage. Almost no time, attention or resources are spent on the relational dynamics on understanding what are the climate differences between the two families. Even when you marry in very similar cultures, so you're saying that two people may be Punjabi marrying a Punjabi. But let's not forget that the ecosystem, the family dynamics, the family karmas are so different that unless you really get an understanding of that climate, what works in their family, how did they grow up, what is deemed to be the right thing to do versus how have I grown up? Unless we get an understanding of that and bridge that gap, we're going to be in for a shock. So simple things like, uh, let's say someone who's grown up in a family where parents are always sitting together, the family always goes out together. And, you know, uh, One partner is from a very nuclear setup where they are more used to privacy and space. And then they get married and they say, what is this? Why are we always sitting with the parents? Why are we always going out together? Where is my marriage? Is there a marriage at all? So we can see they may have come from similar cultures, even similar eco stratas, but yet there are differences that need to be bridged. I don't think we factor in fully for these aspects. The fourth thing is that couples are given too little time and space to settle in. Marriage needs a safe container for it to blossom and grow well. But from day one, the couple is so swamped with issues related to in-laws, to relatives, to friends, to customs, pretenses, all of that. And so much of their energy is spent in either pacifying or blending in or accommodating or adapting to the needs of everyone else that very little time is spent strengthening the relationship between the partners. And I truly believe that couples must be given at least one to two years of enough room and private space to be able to understand each other, strengthen their bond, learn to honor and respect each other, so that then from that uh, ground of safety, they can then learn to respect and honor all of the uh, stakeholders in their families. And that will become meaningful because now you want to do it. You're not forced to do it or compelled to do it. So these are four. And the fifth, which is, according to me, the most important, which is there is a life design. And nobody tells us this, that we are going to end up with partners who mirror the same wounding patterns that we had with our opposite gender parent. So let's say that I have a problem with my father or uh, a boy has a problem with the mother in childhood. 
they will attract the same sort of partner and this is a design of nature to help you frequently interact with that wounding pattern to be able to heal it first recognize it of course and then attend to it and to heal it and to overcome it which really means that time and again you're going to encounter some sort of friction disturbance pain struggle and the problem of the fault is not with the other but that it is nature's design to help you polish and reform your own consciousness and your own wounds uh, so these I, are these are some of the reasons why marriage can be uh, a bit of a shock to our senses so with uh, what idea should youngsters enter into marriage uh, because unless until there is an incentive why would anybody want to get married and these are the incentives that you'll get a romantic partner uh, you will have somebody to uh, share your uh, so no challenges or uh, sufferings with or you will have somebody to fall back upon in times of need and you have an emotional cushion would be available to you so if this uh, rosy picture is taken away and this reality is presented to them don't you think that uh, people in the first place would not want to get married i mean what's the whole point if this is the if uh, that is going to be my ordeal after marriage why to marry in the first place so what should be the you know the correct representation of marriage before youngsters if we want them to kind of have a happy and harmonious married life it's wrong so i am tempted to give you several answers to this questions as you were speaking there were many thoughts uh, in my mind and the first one is if we rewind we didn't even want to come into the embodied form because we knew this was going to take a lot of hard work practice right and which is one of the re- reasons that when a baby enters this reality and the spirit is fully embodied into its uh, physical body it cries because it knows okay this is not going to be a playground this is going to be a classroom so i am going to have to work hard i have Uh, set up challenges for myself and they are all part of my evolution and growth so if we take that context and now transpose it into so why should someone want to get into marriage there is a step that has to happen before marriage which in a lot of cases is not happening it's a missing piece these days of the puzzle and that that piece is called individuation you know in the tribal cultures when a boy or a girl came of age there were rituals to help them become individuated which meant that they they were able to overcome their own fears they were able to attend to their own needs they were able to make themselves safe and they conquered their demons and they came back into society then got married and then learned to take care of another which is a partner and then contribute to the community as a whole which is why we know that they were um many rituals individuating rituals which some of you may be familiar with where a young boy uh, post puberty is then taken into the forest and left there for 3 days so that he can overcome the fear of all the animals and then he's brought back into the village and uh, he is then announced man he is then allowed to marry and then he is allowed to contribute work and contribute to the village i don't think individuation is happening today so what's happening is we have um young adults uh, 30 year old teenagers who go straight from their parents hotel into marriage and then hit the shock like what ever happened to my life they're not individuating so they're not feeling confident about being able to take care of themselves and then take care of the other which is the partner unless you are able to do that you're then just looking for satisfy my needs and mm. that is a very infant uh, or infantile requirement you know you can't live your life or go through life thinking um if my needs are met i'm okay you can't look at marriage as a way that the other people will satisfy my needs i need to also be able to work as a fully individuated individual who can take care of myself and also take care of others now when we come from that space we know how to create that understanding with each other we know how to experience the joys of uh, intimacy 
And when I say intimacy, I'm not referring to only bodily intimacy, but I'm talking about intimacy at all levels, being fully present for the other pe- person, showing up during difficult challenges, um, understanding their psychological needs. So you can see that we have a very different partnership if somebody has individuated or a marriage where both individuals have individuated and then they come together, offer each other space as well as connection, a deep connection. Okay. Um, I think this is a kind of still, you know, some way of this kind of uh, evolution that we want in, uh, to happen in society where men and women are so so self-aware that they eventually form very beautiful partnerships but then self-awareness is it's, it's quite a journey and uh, you know unless and until the parents themselves are self, self-aware uh, they would not really facilitate their own children into going onto this path and uh, no, bec- uh, becoming uh, complete people in their own selves. So that's all, I think, related to a huge amount of self-awareness which the society requires. So uh, Shivi, let's, look, let's just look this. at you know, what you just mentioned. In so many marriages, in bad marriages or difficult marriages having trouble, we so often hear the parents saying, Bacha karlo, solve ho problem. Mm-hmm. Now, can you imagine, you have not individuated you're still having trouble with your own self and with your partner, which is why you're not showing up in the other person's life fully. And you're going to bring a soul into uh, this marriage and then expose him to the dis- your dysfunctions. And that child is learning and embodying or imitating the same dysfunctions. This is the problem. We are not willing to, as individuals, say, okay, I will only have a child when I feel financially, mentally, spiritually, psychologically ready to take care of another soul, I'm navigating the soul. I've been assigned the responsibility of be giving him the gifts or her the gifts of um, becoming fully blossomed humans. Uh, women are always under the pressure of marrying early so that they can have children. Otherwise, they wait too long for themselves to become emotionally, psychologically and financially strong. So they might, uh, you know, the, the, the time might, might be off and they, they may not be in a physical uh, position to bear children. So, so Shivi, you are talking, you're talking about the body clock here. And let yes. me make the point huh. that... The problem is not that uh, itna time lag jayega to become um, ready for marriage. The mm-hmm. problem is nobody starts reading ch- their children for marriage. I started having these these this, this sort of training or marinating my children into this sort of training from the day they were born or even actually before they were born when they were still in the womb. Okay. So, so the question is, if we are first, we as parents, now we can't talk about what happened to the generations behind, you know, that that preceded us, because uh, that would be unfair. I think our grandmothers went through a very different sort of social environment, and they struggled a lot. But let's talk about today and what we can do today. When we talk to young children today who are looking to get married, my suggestion to them is marry for the right reason, become parents for the right reasons, and if you need to invest time and energy to start feeling ready for parenting because you have a body clock, do find the time, prioritize it, whatever is required. But how many people today are willing to invest in their own personal growth? Everything is so externally focused. Okay. So, uh, uh, Susie, let, let's come to you know the real marriages. Uh, where you know people are into marriages and they're facing difficulties they might not have the luxury or the privilege to have such parents or such an environment uh, where they could really uh, go into self exploration first before uh, tying the knot um, but still you know it's not that people who are into marriages they don't want it to work they want those problems to go away they want to have a happy and harmonious uh, relationship with each other but there are several factors that come into play and certain few things are very common, like, you know, men, com- uh, women complain that men do not listen. And men say that women nag. 
and women say we nag because he doesn't listen so how to kind of break this barrier how to kind of you know resolve these issues uh, where people are not stand off fish but they can actually understand the place from where the other person is coming which is like i find it very surprising two people are bedded for life they're living with each other they share the same bed and yet there's so much of you know mental uh, distance from each other they can't understand that's uh, something very surprising so what do you have to uh, say about such people who are wanting to bridge this gap between their relationship so you're absolutely right shivi and the, it's a real pity that again this goes back to what skills and training we've been provided are we ever taught to communicate or to listen that is the question so here women are nagging because they don't know how to speak in a way that they will be heard and men are not listening because they haven't developed the art of listening and in a lot of couples therapy this is one thing that i work very actively with the men where i help them listen and i help the women learn or in fact both partners learn how to speak to each other that puts them into learning mode rather than into conflict mode so typically there are three areas and the first is how to communicate effectively here when we just talk about uh, the process involved you first need to check in with yourself and know what am i feeling now very often women just react they are not even entirely sure or whether it's men or women it's not specific i i don't think it's always women who nag and i don't want to categorize them like that but i'm saying partners when they are upset and they want to approach or problem solve they go straight into their reaction and saying tumne ye nahi kiya ya tumne ye nahi kiya that's that's blame mode attack instead of first checking in and saying okay do i know what i'm really angry about or upset about and why am i feeling this so first excavate your own mind your thoughts and your feelings then you need to know how to express that problem without blaming shaming or complaining thirdly you need to then observe to see how what you're saying is landing for the other is that person going into protection mode is that person wanting to run away how is that person behaving and finally you need to reconfirm if your what you're trying to express has been interpreted correctly or not these four steps are very very important because usually what happens is one person who's feeling upset or angry and agitated is going to say something which is provocative or which will uh, in simple words piss the other person off that other person will react because they are feeling threatened so they'll go straight into protection mode when you're in protection mode no learning can take place so you actually he's shut down or she's shut down they're not even listening to your problem now mm-hmm. and because they've shut down you feel you're not being heard and this just becomes worse with time and then both of them either they decide not to talk to each other the problem is lost in the reactions there is no learning happening here and this is usually either people will be silent for days and not speak to each other or pretend everything is normal brushed under the carpet but the pain keeps accumulating inside and the relationship becomes more and more distant yes. the second thing is that you must know when to communicate you can't fly off the handle and expect that the other person is going to be very calm the other person is not a loving parent the other person is your equal you're going to react they are going to react and there's nothing's going to come out of it so find the right time and i usually say if you're feeling upset about something take time off to check in with yourself to come to some understanding of the problem within yourself and then find the right opportunity when when the partner is not in a reactive mode to sit down and say hey can we talk about this and then both of you are working towards finding solutions addressing each other's problems you're willing to be heard you're not walking away or shutting down it's not a fight or flight happening over there and the third is differentiate between reaction and response again i know a lot of us we have a lot of information uh, available on the media but how my, how many of us actually are aware when i am reacting and when i am in a position to respond if i'm agitated if i'm overwhelmed i'm definitely not going to be in a risk 
responsive mode. I am definitely going to react. And when I react, the other person is only going to shut down because they are feeling threatened. So there's just no point doing that. We have to understand that when somebody, when we expect the other to respond, firstly, we have to be in peaceful mode because a response is a peace talk. So just imagine if two countries are going to war and ready to drop a nuclear bomb, right? That is when both of you are reactive. All you're going to do is drop those nuclear bombs. But if you are looking at having peace talks with two countries, how would you go into those peace talks? How will you dis you will discuss, you will negotiate, you will listen to each other, you will want to shift your position, have an open mind, be willing to see their perspective too. Does this really happen in a real marriage? It's not happening because we don't have the skills of communicating, of listening, of speaking in a way like we can be heard. Whenever we speak, couples will start by saying, he's not doing this, she's not doing that. I've told her so many times to do this. No, I always mention this training starts with, start with how you are feeling. So instead of saying, you let me down, you take the ownership and say, I felt let down yesterday. So immediately, you're not pointing a finger, but you're sharing a emotional state with the other. And they are more likely to listen to you than if you go in there with all guns raging. So what can you do to improve the communication in the marriage? First, check in to understand your own feelings, your level of threat, and your reactiveness. If you're feeling very threatened, very angry, very reactive, please don't have a talk. Take time. Figure yourself out. Then go into peace talks. Secondly, soothe yourself first. When you're feeling agitated or angry, your nervous system is in a state of chaos. Your intellect is clouded. You are brain fogged. You can't see things clearly. Anything you, that comes out of your mouth is likely to be wrong at that point in time. You need to feel safe before you go into a peace talk. Schedule time for discussions. And do it in an environment that is calm, conducive to listening for both people. Whatever you want to express in that peace talk, please do it without blaming, shaming, criticizing, or complaining. Be specific. And remember, your aim is to harmonize. Your aim is to, at the end of that discussion, make both people feel united again. Like we are on the same page. We have the same goals. We are in it for the long run. Clarify if required, because very often I find that couples don't clarify and uh, people misunderstand, misinterpret. And so it's always good to say, you know, have you understood me? Have I been able to communicate effectively? Would you like me to expand on this further? Learn to listen better without interrupting. This is an important one because very often I've seen men tend to, you know, when, when somebody is talking in this nice way and they are being received well, the men will want to jump in and fix the problem for you. And very often women don't want to fix the problem because they know how to fix the problem. They're capable of fixing the problem. They simply want to be heard. So just listen to them very intently. And some men will get very offended if while they are speaking to you, the woman keeps interrupting with her thought. Let each person speak their heart out. When they're completing, the other should speak. So it should be done in a very, very uh, honoring way when you have these peace dialogues. It's important to check in with the other how they are feeling because if somebody is shut down, they might just go into, into a quiet, you know, quietness, not because they're feeling resolved, but because they're saying, Are yaar, isse ab karke koi nahi chupi ho ja. mm. So if they've gone into that zone, then you know you've actually not reached the gates of peace. Then maybe you need to say, Have I said something to upset you? Why are you feeling shut down? You need to continue that dialogue. You need to, both partners need to create safe space. Now, most of us don't know how to hold space for each other, but without holding space, you cannot reach any peaceful resolution. 
And finally, it's very important. You must recognize both your own and your partner's hot buttons. When you're having peace talks, please avoid hot buttons because very often you're seeing the peace talks opens very nicely. Then when a difficult conversation comes up, then they are uh, passive aggressive comments. There may be some under the belt comments. There may be something which is a reaction because you got triggered and you said something. Awareness of hot buttons means that you have to promise yourself, no matter what happens, I am not going to say these things. So as you can see, all of this takes a fair amount of maturity. And um, this, is, this is something that I say that it's part of your workout, which is why when I put that social media post out today saying that you really need to work out to have a good marriage, that means you need to learn to speak without provoking the other or blaming the other and you need to learn to listen and you need a good enough knowledge of each other's hot buttons. So it's a two-way street. It isn't Susie. It is the honest cannot Absolutely. be a one partner to heal everything in a, a marriage. So, you know, one person could be all uh, prepared with everything uh, to do to uh, resolve the issue and the other person is totally uh, not on the same page and kind of not even appreciative of the efforts of the spouse. So then I, I don't think the, the efforts will amount to much, but it is essential that both of them are in this mind space that uh, both of them have to grow uh, or reach a certain space where communication is happening seamlessly in this proper understanding and proper resolution to things. Because uh, it's, and this is where the challenge lies that both have to have that kind of willingness and as well as awareness to be able to uh, resolve issues uh, fairly. You know, uh, Shivi, this is a bit idealistic because let's be honest, when, when two people come into a marriage, they are never, they are never at the same level of um, psychological or spiritual maturity. It can never be the same. They'll be at different levels, you know, just like libidos are never at the same level. They are always different. So we are humans after all. And I'm saying, uh, this is one of the reasons I said that a couple must be given at least the first two years to have the safe space to do these experiments, adjustments, to do work with each other, do this workout with each other. So you may go in where one partner is better equipped than the other partner. But if you take this approach, which is a responsive approach, if you have a commitment to the marriage, and maybe that is something that I need to speak about, that what, what makes marriages go wrong and therefore what are the things we need to do? And we could take this on after this um, we've addressed this fully so then if both of them are committed to a common goal they will engage in the process and if one partner is better equipped they must try and enroll the other partner into okay this is what we want to do i'm sure neither of the partners get married with the intention of um, not going to a you know to a place of harmony and if they do then my big question is, have you done your homework before the premarital part of the work? And that's also something I mentioned, the focus is too much on the externals. You know, six months before the marriage is ready, but there's no premarital homework. We should have been able to see these red flags before we agreed to get married to each other. And that's why I think it's very important, even in arranged marriages, that three to six months you're allowed to Let's not call it date if families don't feel comfortable with that, but meet each other and understand each other. And that's not about let's go and have a coffee. It's about having some really courageous conversations in those six months to understand, are we capable of working together as a team? Because marriage is teamwork. So ya to aapne apna premarital homework nahi kiya hai, because in today's environment, uh, at least in urban India, I think a lot of parents are a lot more open to having their uh, children say, no, I don't want to marry this person. So you're not being forced into marriage. You're not just being shown somebody's photograph and said, hey, achha, ab shadi kar lo. you're allowed to meet. So it's not just a kundali match. Ho but tumhari psychological and spiritual kundali match hoti hai ki nahi hoti hai. Ye kaam to aapko hi karna padega. So, मेरे ख्याल से मतलब आपके कहने का मतलब यह है कि इससे पहले कि वो जयमाल और फेरे वगैरह हो एटलीस्ट साल छह महीना एक दूसरे के साथ ढंग से रह के देखो 
कि हम कितना ज्यादा कंपैटिबल है और उसके बाद ही देन यू नो गो एंड फॉर्मलाइज द मैरिज सो नो लेट मी बी क्लियर आई एम नॉट सजेस्टिंग द लिव इन if somebody wants to do that that's perfectly fine but there may be enough um, families that that will be appalled the idea of living together um but i'm saying at least meet up meet each other with the intention of um penetrating the psyche and i keep saying the psyche because it's not about do you like coffee and do you like tea and what books do you read and what uh, netflix serials do you watch that's very superficial you need to talk about what are your you know approach to finances are we going to if we get married are we going to have similar bank accounts is it your money my money is it our money uh, what happens if uh, what is our approach to elder care what happens when the parents are ill how what what is your perspective about it so there are some very complex conversations you know we have couples who who after they are married are having a conflict about um one partner wants a child the other doesn't and i'm saying why didn't you clarify this at ground zero first mm. why is this conflict arising now those were discussions that ought to have been had earlier so uh, okay so see my next question is is love enough in itself to keep the marriage together and if not why because love should be the most important bond that which soul does a couple my my first question is do we even understand what love is so love is definitely not interest not not enough and the reason it's not enough is because both life and marriage like i mentioned a little earlier uh they are soul polishing agents and soul polishing agents mean we come into this life yahan pe hamari class lagegi class lagegi iska matlab there will be friction there will be challenges there will be pressure there will be buffing and through repeated triggers of our own wounding and our own safety strategies that we developed as children we will be able to overcome or at least become aware of our mental distortions and the psychological prisons that we are stuck in which is why we see the world through colored glasses and the whole idea is to be able to get out of those prisons to be able to shed the colored glasses but instead what do we end up doing we end up putting on more and more colored glasses because we are only pointing the di- finger in the opposite direction we are only blaming the partner we are not saying okay why has my soul chosen to create these very complex situations we are always comparing ourselves and looking at the other uski zindagi to theek hai meri zindagi theek nahi hai uska partner ye karta hai mera partner ye kyun nahi karta and the answer to that is that you're also in the marriage because of karma redemption so redeeming whatever past karmas you have that also that karm katni has to happen and then through that you will become more aware of your own pain you will become aware of being more empathetic towards the other person your whole spiritual journey can begin because let's face it without any sort of wounding and suffering we don't even get on to the path of spirituality you know we only start searching for truth or for what is life all about when we are going through immense pain in our lives so we also need to recognize ki hamari dono ki families mein kuch na kuch dysfunctions bhi honge are we going to perpetuate them blindly or do we want to put an end to those family traumas and to those uh, family dysfunctions and are we willing to be better parents to the progeny that we together will create right so there is dealing with the past which is your past karma there is a future possibility of um, being better parents and raising what i call the golden children of the future and there is this present and current issue of how can i heal my own or get out of my own mental prisons of the uh, psychological wounding that i encountered as a child because that will help me develop new tendencies new capacities within myself which is why i took birth in the first place so roughly becoming more self aware of yourself and healing your own self it starts there redeeming past karmas attuning to the needs of others so that you can be more unity conscious and then ending the perpetuation of family traumas and errors now tell me does this look like marriage is about love this looks like real work 
And that is why I say that if you are, uh, if you want to become aware of your own traumas, your own wounding patterns, then there is a lot of self-awareness and self-study. You have to put yourself under the microscope and study yourself very diligently. Okay. Mera wounding pattern kya tha? Mera life script kya hai? What is my belief about life? What are my worldview filters through which I'm experiencing this life? But we spend all our life just blaming the others, my in-laws, my partner, everybody else. We never stop and say, nobody is wrong. I created this context for my evolution. And it's not a question of I'm wrong or they are wrong. Ye wrong ko to equation se nikali do. It's a context for growth. It's painful. Yes, of course it is. Somebody else's life is better. No, it isn't. You don't know what challenges they are going through. Everybody has their set of challenges. Everybody has come here to refine themselves. We will all be afflicted by our families of birth. We will be wounded there. And then we will have the opportunity in the family of affinity to refine and polish our souls and become better humans. Okay. So... Uh especially in uh, say no, marriages we often see especially uh, cases of uh, newly wedded uh, women so they they do you know kind of uh, create a love rosy picture of marriage and then when they enter then they realize that the husband is not uh, standing up for her and the, the, especially if the mother in law is very difficult or the, the in laws are very difficult and demanding and the mother then feels that the son is neglecting me just because he is born in a new wife so there's a clash and a conflict of interest right you know in the say in the house where the girl has entered so how what should be the husband's role in such a situation because he is the one who's getting sandwiched between two parties and yeah. we see that a lot of uh, anguish and pain uh, Resulted, uh, results uh, because of this situation. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, a simple visual answer to this is if you take a glass jar and you add some TT balls into the glass jar and then you add one last ball to it and we find kya hota hai, ki all the other balls get displaced to make room for this last ball. I think that is what needs to happen in a marriage. When there is a new person coming into that ecosystem, everybody has to move back and create room for this new person. Okay? There has to be a clear understanding that there will be an energetic shift in the dynamics in that family. And it's not just marriage. If your son or your daughter leaves home and says, you say, goes overseas for study or whatever else. You'll find that your and if you're sensitive, you'll see that the energetic feeling has shifted in the house. If a new um, helper comes into the house, you'll find the ecosystem either becomes more vibrant or more depressive. Here is someone in marriage, we have embraced somebody. We have brought them in. So it's very important that existing family members move a little backward, create a little space to embrace this person. And I'm saying it applies both ways. If it is a gharjavai situation, so then they should do this to the girls. If the girl is going to the girl's house, then they should do this to the girls. It's not gender specific. It's saying there is someone coming from a foreign uh, environment into this ecosystem. All of you are well bonded. You know each other. This person needs to be absorbed into this system. So it's very important that the son will need to step out on his own hero's journey and make room for the new partnership, which means he needs to go out. He needs to be ready to battle the challenges, which means understand that if things are not going to be the same with my mom anymore. I am ready to take on the crisis that that will create. I will discover something about my own self in the process, which is the hero's journey. And then I will come back into the relationship with the mother more evolved. So he must, the son has to set out on a hero's journey. He can't expect, Jaisa rishta pehle tha shadi se pehle, it will remain the same. It is not possible because the energetic dynamics has shifted. 
What he also needs to do is to encourage both the wife and the mother to build a direct equation. Now, very often, this is an error a lot of people make. The mother-in-law, because she's more comfortable with her son, she will route all communication or difficult or challenging communication through the son. And the son becomes the courier between the mother and the wife. That's not his role. But he needs to be able to find the courage to stand up and say, both to his mother and his wife, cab directly, but you don't like something, speak to the other person in a loving, respectful manner. And then he's encouraging a strong bond to be built between those two people directly. He must also discourage the mother's criticisms of the wife. Now, this happens very frequently, kaibari overtly, kaibari covertly. Because the mother has an old bond with the son, if she has any resentment, she will either quietly slip into a private conversation with the son or she will express it openly. Not realizing that by doing that, I'm really putting my son into an awkward position. Number one, I am pulling him away from this new equation where he needs to grow roots. And I am also making it very complex for him because he's going to go into that room and say, what am I going to do with this new information my mother's just given? Obviously, she wants to fix something. If she doesn't have the capacity to fix it directly with her daughter-in-law, and to build a loving bond with her daughter-in-law, how does she expect the son to do it without damaging his partnership with this new person? So this is very important that the son discourages. But he can keep rerouting and saying, Mama, if you feel this way, talk to her. Na. And then not go back to his wife and uh, carry that baggage to the bedroom. That should not happen. It's also equally important to listen to the wife's pain. The wife is adjusting in a new ecosystem. She may have, have, may have some hygiene issues, hygiene factors. Hey, I find this different. It was different in my house. You know, little things. They don't have to be big things, but it could be something simply like when I go to the toilet, you know, it's a door hai bathroom, wo sab dekhte hai, mujhe sharamat. Who else will she speak to if not her partner? So he has to have a year for her pain. He has to be able to problem solve for her. She's in unfamiliar territory. So on the face of it, it might look, oh, this is not equal. This is not fair. Why should he say no to the mother? And why should he listen to the wife? And I'm saying because the mother is on home ground. The mother has her own husband to share a pain with. Who does this new entrant talk to? So it's very important that that happens. And the boy has to unshackle the relationship with the mother. Because the girl has anyway had to alter or adapt her relationship with her parents. She's also doing it. It's not unique only to the boy. Both partners have set out onto a new journey of life. Both their equations will change with everyone they've known before, including their friends, including their families. And they have to be ready and willing to take on this change. They have to reorient. They have to adapt. And they must develop a new relationship. And the new relationship will not resemble or replicate the old relationship. So... Sons have to take on the onus of saying, okay, I will take the hero's journey, even if I need to sort of uh, detach for a period of time while I'm attaching to my wife, but I will come back and be able to honor my mother in the right way. This is a complex one. There is a great onus on um, the boy to be able to simply navigate the direction properly because unfortunately, in this context, it's always the girls who've been told, to me adjust karna padega. Kisi ne ladkon ko ke nahi sikhaya ke tumhye bhi adjust karna padega. Kisi ne ye nahi samjhaya ke dynamics badlenge, maa ke saath same nahi rahega. Koi nahi baat karta, ye baat hai to koi karta hi nahi, jabki ye kaha jata hai ki kitna achha ladka hai, dekho shadi ke baad bhi nahi badla. 
और लड़की से उम्मीद की जाती है कि तुम बिल्कुल ही बदल जाओ अगर नहीं बदली हो तो दैट्स अ मैटर ऑफ शेम सो दिस इज अ वेरी अनफेयर एंड इट इज बीन गोइंग ऑन इन सोसाइटी फॉर अ वेरी वेरी लॉन्ग टाइम एंड आई वंडर बाय द ह्यूमन सोसाइटी नेवर थॉट ऑफ ओपनिंग अप सम काइंड ऑफ यू नो एजुकेशन इंस्टीट्यूशन uh which can coach people on how to have a happy and harmonious married life and how to navigate these treacherous relationships which of they which always come into play and you know change the dynamics they sometimes the husband and wife uh, get along with each other very well but it's like the external factors which will distort things and then they don't know how to handle sometimes you know then it may not be mother in law sometimes it's just nothing but jealous friends who can't see you happy and then uh, you know they like to fill the years of the girl or the uh, years of the husband and you know and they, they will try to make him more chauvinistic so a husband who's getting along well with his wife who's like taking good care of her and who's ha- feeling happy is uh, taunted upon by the society yeah. it is they told tum to joru ke gulam ban gaye gulam ho and the, true, <laughs> uh, the real man is somebody you know who who keeps the wife in her place and who kind of is able to command her and so you know it is uh, at times like this that i think whosoever is saying that unse ye ja ke puchna chahiye ki agar aap apni zindagi rewind karte ho and if you have a desire what kind of a spouse would you have wanted to wahan pe it's a case of sour grapes ke hamare ko to ye sab nahi mila to tumhe kyun mil raha hai and that maturity needs to be there in the young boys and girls because like i said we can't go back and change our ancestors we can only make the change effect the change in our own lives and then effect the change for our progeny and become uh, start treating both our sons they can be better prepared in their marriages and their partnerships and they can have really strong and sacred relationships with each other okay uh, we still have a lot many questions left but i think uh, the time is now almost over we have only 5 minutes left so i'll ask you one last question and then uh, we will open this uh, forum for discussion i mean questions uh, by the listeners and hopefully uh, maybe we'll have uh, we'll try to have another episode of the, of the same topic where other uh, you know topics could be covered related to marriage so uh, okay suzy i'll ask you the last question how should couples make important decisions in life because it often becomes a big bone of contention between them usko lekar bahut lapda ho jata hai ki often we'll see that this one partner who will impose his decision it's mostly the house patriarch and everybody has to abide by him whereas uh, uh, the woman feels that you no know, i am a new entrant and obviously my life is also involved so i should also be consulted and mostly this is dismissed because she is expected to just carry the orders silently and uh, uh, you know be another cog in the wheel so then you know what should uh, should be the you know the road map for the uh, so i'm i'm going to talk about what really needs to happen in that decision making process if it is a nuclear setup and it's just the husband and wife which in a lot of cases today where both are working they're living by themselves then this is obviously happening just between them if they are in an environment like you mentioned where there is another family patriarch who's really taking all the decisions then this needs to happen between the husband and wife in close spaces in their bedroom and this understanding between them and then the husband needs to represent this joint understanding and take it to the patriarch so the first important thing is it's very important to not be reactive about big decisions spend enough time reflecting debating discussing the impact on the marriage without shutting down very often when there are tricky subjects uh, you know it may be okay should be one decision that often comes is people are living together and then they decide to move out because there's too much conflict in the family and every time this decision is uh, the the question is raised one the boy may shut down saying ki how will i sort of explain it to my parents but it's very important that this be discussed openly you can agree time frames you can you know everything is can be discussed as adults the second thing is you must identify the impact on all the other stakeholders okay if we go ahead with option a how is it going to affect everyone what is going to be the um, challenges what are going to be the roadblocks and obstacles how will they react and this is where the boy's hero journey really comes into play can he take on those challenges or not take on those challenges 
So once you have identified all of these roadblocks, you need to solve for it together. If it's like that, then we will do this. Not we will do this. So this enrollment is very important. That when breakdowns happen, when disagreements arise, we are going to be on the same page. You must support each other when things go southwards. Again, this happens. Uh, a decision is taken, but somewhere along the way, it doesn't turn out to be a very healthy decision. And then everybody is pointing the finger at each other. Both partners are saying, "Maine ye kya kyunki tumne mujhe force kiya tha aur the maine ye kya kyunki tum ye chahti thi." That finger pointing things may go southwards, but at that point in time, instead of blaming each other, go into crisis management. And if you are finding that it's irreconcilable your differences, then please seek help and go to a third neutral party who could be a very um, supportive. family friend or a cousin or if that doesn't also work then you can seek outside help through a mentor or counselor fifth is that you must be willing to have open and courageous conversations ye ek bahut bada um, challenge i have seen in a lot of marriages the trouble starts when you are not willing to have transparent conversations with each other so a lot of stuff is brushed under the carpet in the in the desire to maintain superficial harmony you'll find that a lot of people will keep letting the discontent breed within and not bring it up and then phir ekdam phatta hai sab kuch you have such an explosion you have a bad fight you have a breakdown it's better to actually address it and say you can even preface it by saying i'm terrified to bring this up with you but you know i really need to get this off my chest remember to course correct wherever needed and be guided by the goals of a marriage so marriage must have common goals and aims and we 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 run out of time otherwise i would have spoken about and maybe the next time we can talk about how those goals need to be formed and what those goals need to be but they must be about we are a team we are on the same team mm. and we're working towards harmony even if it means that i have to make some compromises with other stakeholders but as long as you and i can be strong and good together we are willing to embark on that journey i think that's a very important that, point that when men and women marry they have to really understand that they are the same team and it's a very valid point you raised and it's not that no uh, the other is uh, meant uh, to fulfill my needs this which is where we go wrong that you i have many needs and desires and you are the means through which they can be fulfilled and this is where things really um, kind of sky dive uh, but yes if we really function from this premise that we are a team and then a lot a lot can be resolved a lot can be healed and many new grounds can be covered in this particular relationship dynamic uh, thank you suzy that was a very very enlightening discussion uh, very different uh, also from what we heard mostly uh on um, advice related to marriage it was deep it was profound it was uh, uh very uh, say informative uh and also you know kind of something which 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 is very thought provoking also so okay uh, i would like uh, the listeners tonight to you know ask their questions if they have any hi uh, i just wanted to ask one question here Can you please uh, uh, share your name oh, this is shruti here um yeah I just wanted to ask if uh, husband and wife are working, and there would be a financial uh, misunderstanding and everything. Uh, How to handle that one? Just a question because so misunderstandings probably arise because there isn't complete transparency um, about the finances, Shristi. Mm-hmm. It's very important. Either you haven't really spelled out what the issue is. because uh, obviously either either of the partners are not coming um, transparently with what they are earning or what they are giving to the parents and this siphoning of funds quietly without um, sharing it with the wife ha- happens in many cases because they feel the wife will oppose but uh, even if the position is tight and if the husband has a desire to contribute to his family or his parents 
he should have the confidence that i can discuss it openly with my wife and she will support me so somewhere i sense that there is a breakdown of trust in each other or that trust has never got built mm-hmm. so i guess what you need to focus on is building the trust then having the courage to have transparent conversations reassuring each other and saying regardless of what is your approach to the finances we can sit down and talk about them as adults now if you have something in specific that you'd like to do you feel comfortable sharing more openly i could perhaps give you more specific uh, solutions uh suzy uh, if you want you can you know share your email id or phone number if you want so that if uh, the listeners tonight want to uh, contact you privately for uh, counseling they can Um, yes yeah, so you can you can just reach me on suzyheelsme at gmail.com which is s u z by h e a l s i oh. i do want to mention that what you raised is a very very important issue it can create finances can create a lot of trouble in marriages and uh, if there is the ability to bring both partners to the table discuss it openly mm-hmm. um with the understanding that we will support each other's deep seated needs or uh, requirements because sometimes there is this feeling of there is a family context of a good son does a b c d and that you'll be a bad son and that starts driving the man but he also understands that maybe finances are very tight and i should not be doing this so he's stuck in some sort of a conflict in his own mind and that will then have ripple effects into the rest of the relationship so important to address the financial issues hi suzy ritu khurana here yes uh, yes as usual you are stupendous and uh, okay. but i just have a suggestion that um, i think many of these problems are so complex many of them need some individual um, i mean maybe of these video sessions what's that, uh, these webinars yes or at least two issues i mean this is yes, a actually that's true shivi and i were just discussing this before we started today's session and i said this is such a vast canvas and uh, shivi also felt that yeah maybe we need sequels yeah. uh, so we'd be happy to bring you those sequels if shivi uh, feels yeah. so Uh, I'll announce the date. Uh, I think maybe in a few days, uh, maybe a couple of days, because I have another recording coming up on Friday or Saturday. So once that is over, I'll uh, you know, discuss with Suzy, and we will uh, fix another date, uh, and we will have the show again because uh, marriage is so wide, so vast, deep, complex that you know one uh, uh, one session is not enough for us to cover all the topics. Uh, we we have not even discussed the sexual problems which arise the issues of infidelity which uh, challenge a marriage and the issues of parenting also which can rent a family apart and obviously finance are definitely a big uh, bone of contention because people are coming from different backgrounds and have different priorities and then they uh, clash because of their different uh, outlooks towards finance and so i do agree a lot of uh, ground has so is still untouched and we need to uh, do another session which we definitely promised to us suzy a personal question yes. how do you Pucho? manage to be a baker a painter a wonderful parent avid traveler and of course a psychologist how do you manage to do all these things i think it's a simple answer that um i am able to draw a lot of inspiration from my own creative center and um i work very very intensely on myself so my day doesn't start uh, my morning pehar is for myself because unless i have done my spiritual work my physical work my spiritual work my emotional work and for me that is an everyday thing i work intensely on myself several hours every single day so when you cleaned out your vessel then you have uh, that much more inspiration to derive from yeah, i had read uh, about your how you came on to came on to your own uh, thing being or existence so you yes i w- i would really think i i really think i receive a lot of that um, from my connection with with the divine over the source 
come to the end of the session. Apparently, we have because I don't see any more questions coming up. But uh, since we have still a lot to cover on this topic, so I'm sure they will come later on. And all of you are free to contact Susie personally uh, for personal sessions and to clarify any other doubts if you have, because she's a, a marvelous coach, trainer, psychologist, I mean, author, writer, everything rolled into one and has such an yeah, yeah. understanding of the human psyche that what I've seen is she's also very intuitive. So even before you say, she will understand what's going on in your heart and where your problems are coming from. True, and true, true. Absolutely. Also from years of experience of uh, having dealt with uh, all kinds of human complexities and uh, challenges that's come in relationship and in the course of living. So thank you, Susie. Thank you so much for sparing your special uh, time to uh, thank you, thank uh, you. to the, our listeners tonight. Thank you so much for coming. So, Shivi, I want to leave today's session by just sharing a few last words. Yeah. And somehow I feel people have this impression that marriages, good marriages don't work on auto mode. Good marriages take a lot of time and effort investment to make them good. You need to have regular discussions. You need to check in frequently. You know, can you imagine if you just bought a car and thought that for the rest of my life, this car is going to run trouble-free and it will never need to go for servicing. So Marriage needs care. Marriage needs effort, time. It must be your priority. So if you can all just decide that I want to make my marriage, a sacred partnership. I want to take it to the next level, wherever it may be. Just try and make that investment. And then you, like I said, one partner may be more evolved than the other. It doesn't mean you'll get a ready-made partner to match your frequency. You get a partner to match your true frequency. So whoever you've got is right for you. It may not feel that way mm -hmm. because it takes a lot of inner yeah. work. But start doing that work and you'll understand the truth of what I'm saying. Do that. <laughs> so marriage is work. Marriage is work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's and work. Be ready, right. be ready to work hard. Don't be yeah. lazy. Mm -hmm. and never in your marriage because taking for granted is one of the biggest uh, grouses people have, especially partners. And that is all a reflection mm -hmm. of your laziness. And not wanting to do that, your part of the work in keeping marriage. And, and I know I need I, I need to spell this out. Marriage's work applies to both genders, not to one. Hmm. Both the partners have to work to make marriage a sacred relationship. So I hope with that, uh, with that little inspiration yeah. or that little mantra, we'll all get back to work to our marriages with renewed understanding. He, uh, my partner is actually helping me refine my own consciousness, do embark on the journey that I actually came for so that by the time I'm ready to drop this physical body, I have done well in the earth class. Actually, uh, mostly most focus, focus on kind of, you know, at somehow changing the partner. And that's where uh, they invest most of it. Kis se mein ko ye ho jai, no? Even our prayers but, are for the spirit. Well, when couples come in for counseling, that's the first thing I say. It's all about you. It's not about them. They are mirrors. They are helping you understand. And then we can, as each understands, we can bridge the gap. But the work is in Absolutely. So, okay. So, thank you, Susie, and thank you all the, uh, all the listeners. Okay, thank you for coming. And thank yeah. you. Please do thank, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Susie, very much. Thank you very much. And thank you, Shivi, for bringing it to us. Yes. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Susie. Thank you, Shivi. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.